One, two, three, four. Wow, this is so exciting. Wow, it's so exciting. Welcome to The Polar Bear Project, a podcast for the autism community. My name's Alan Doyle, and today we're meeting with Sir Simon Baron-Cohen. Simon is a clinical psychologist and professor of developmental psychopathology at the University of Cambridge, where he's director of ARC, the university's autism research centre. Simon is a published author. His latest book titled The Pattern Seekers, A New Theory of Human Invention was published in November 2020, and this year he was knighted for his services to people with autism. Simon is renowned within the autism community worldwide and in today's show we discuss what attracted Simon to researching autism and he shares his views on the complexity of the spectrum. He has an exciting and somewhat exclusive announcement about the latest research project that he's involved in, Spectrum 10K, and Simon explains what's involved. We hope you enjoy the conversation and take something of value from it. If so, please like and subscribe to the podcast on whatever format you listen to your podcasts on. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe and click the bell for notifications of new episodes. Enjoy the show. Simon, you're very, very welcome. I really appreciate you coming on with us today. Thank you, Alan, for inviting me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. (laughs) Great, great. Well, before we hear all about Spectrum 10K, can I ask you, why autism? What led you to dedicating such a significant part of your life's work to autism? Yeah, I mean, you know how how people's careers sometimes just happen by chance. You know, I I happened to get a job after I graduated from university. I happened to get a job as a teacher in a small school, uh, a little uh, a unit for autistic kids. This is back in the eighties. You know, when we when we didn't know much about autism, Um, but you know it's. Uh, you know, many of your listeners will will know that autism is both, um, it's important, uh, it, but it's also fascinating. And both aspects of, you know, for me, kind of grabbed my, my interest. And I went off, I went off to do a PhD after that, just to kind of um, go down the research route. Right. Very good. Very good. And as you said, so much has progressed over the years with research. And and I suppose probably most notable and remarkable is is in more recent times is the the paradigm shift from autism awareness to autism acceptance and neurodiversity and the and the neurodiverse movement. and I suppose I really want to, you know, as I said, we'll get to the, to, to the new research study. But I suppose for one thing for me as, as, as a parent and as someone who's been 19 years now in the, in, in the community, um, it, th- there's a question. And, and for me, it is like, how best do we celebrate autistic difference and yet support and help people who suffer because of autistic difference? And, uh, you know, it, it's a... It's kind of somewhat of a paradox, I guess, but, um, you know, but but please, uh, you know, I've heard you speak uh, incredibly on this topic. So uh, by the floor, the floor is yours, Simon. Sure. Um, so maybe I'll just start with picking up on one word that you said, which is suffer. You know, you know, you know, you know, because is it the case that autistic people, children or adults, uh, you know, inevitably have to suffer from or, mm-hmm. from autism. You know, and I guess mm-hmm. that's that's the big question, really. Like, if there was if there was enough support, mm-hmm. if, you know, if society was uh, providing everything that families need and that kids need, you know, would there be any any level of suffering? And you know, obviously, you know, it's it's a, we're talking about maybe an an ideal because we're not yet at that stage. Mm-hmm. But I, I think, you know, I think it is possible to see autism as an example of neurodiversity, as, as difference, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but obviously people don't get the diagnosis if they're, if they're not struggling in some way. Right. You know, right. The, the diagnosis is there to signal that they need support. And, mm-hmm. you know, what, I, what I'm hoping we'll, we'll see in the future is that as soon as someone gets their diagnosis, there's enough support, you know, more than enough support, so that there isn't any sense of suffering. 
mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And the other word I might pick up on that you mentioned is about acceptance. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not just trying to raise awareness about autism, but we're trying to just encourage society to accept autistic people exist. They are, they're equal to anyone else. Um, you know, we should, yeah. you know, we should find a place for everybody and give kind of equal dignity, equal respect, whether you're autistic or, you know, wh- whatever your kind of makeup is. Yes, yeah, a- absolutely. And and it, it kind of le- leads me on, uh, again, I've been doing a, a bit of research, uh, Simon, in preparation for today. And um, the in, in the DSM-5, you co-authored a paper and... I suppose the, the one thing that I found really, really useful, and I, I'd like you to explain or expand on it in terms of understanding the spectrum and some of the classifications within the spectrum. Uh, you you mentioned um, first of all the the I suppose the the, the, fir- the first term uh, ASC, so autism spectrum conditions rather than ASD, but then you go on to mention the four Ds. So please, please explain. I, I think that is really, really important and very helpful for everyone, as I say, to understand the spectrum and some of the classifications, because I think it's really good. Okay, so yeah, so I've talked about the four Ds. So for the, be- for the benefit of your listeners, you know, the, these are, you know, disorder, because mm-hmm. in, in much of the world, particularly in America, they talk about autism spectrum disorder. Um, Another D could be disease, because again, mm-hmm. sometimes autism is kind of viewed within a medical framework as if it's mm-hmm. a disease that needs treatment, you know. Mm-hmm. And then a, 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 another D would be difference. We've started talking about that. And the, fi- the final D would be disability. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think, you know, some people argue which is the appropriate label or the appropriate word to use. And actually, I think probably all four of these Ds apply, depending on which aspect of autism you're looking at. You know, the, 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 the idea of difference, I think, is, I think it's very clear that, auti- you know, when, if, if you look at uh, how autistic children and adults learn and process information, they're clearly doing it differently. And sometimes that does lead to disability. So that's the second D. For example, if they're if they're sort of late to develop speech or language, uh, if they're struggling to read people's emotions when they're looking at people's faces, you know that could be a disability. Um, the the idea about disorder or disease, well, sometimes autism is accom- accompanied by by conditions that the person actually suffers from. An example might be epilepsy, you know. And another example might be gastrointestinal pain. You know, these things happen more often in autism than they do in the general population. And it might be appropriate to think about treatments or even cures for symptoms that are causing suffering. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, so I think rather than saying autism is just a difference, I think we have to be open minded and say, you know, autism is quite complex. And it depends on sort of which aspect you're looking at. But certainly, I, to me, the difference can encompass both disability and even strengths or talents. And maybe we'll talk about that. Exactly, exactly. And, that's, and, and really, that's what kind of le- le- leads me on, on to that. And I think as well, in particular, in your book, The Pattern Seekers, um, you really, there's, there's the innovation that you describe um, and uh, if you want to just talk about in terms of the, those strengths and, uh, and how you identify that in, in your book. Sure. So, I mean, we've given, um, we've given autistic people little tests of uh, pattern recognition and autistic people often perform above average, but, you know, better than non-autistic people do on these tests. So, so despite the fact that they may have a disability when it comes to social skills, uh, maybe communication skills, you know, other areas of their intelligence may even be superior, you know. And pattern recognition, particularly the ability to sort of look at a system and imagine how could this system work differently, 
So kind of thinking, I, I, in, in my book, I call them if and then patterns. You know, what if I took this object and I did, you know, I used it differently, then would I, would I get a different result? So it's if and then. And autistic people are often are kind of very interested in how does the system work? They might pick up a toy and want to uh, take it apart to see how it works. You know, I've met autistic kids who, you know, you give them a computer, they actually want to open it up and see what's inside. So, and, you know, and they may, they may want to start rearranging some of the components inside there to see if they can make their computer go faster or have more memory or whatever. So, you know, to me, you know, this is a sign that autistic people often question things. If they don't just necessarily, you know, uh, you know, follow what someone's told them. They want to kind of understand things for themselves. And in my book, I argue that, you know, this is the basis for invention or innovation. You know, that we need people who think differently, who question, could we be doing things differently? And uh, I go, you know, in the book, I go on to kind of um, outline some of the evidence that actually the history of human progress um, you know, has depended on uh, autistic people or people with a lot of autistic traits coming up with new ways of doing things. Um, yeah. So, we, you know, we conducted a genetic study and this kind of links to what we'll talk about shortly with yes, spe yeah. Spectrum 10K. But one of our genetic studies in the past, um, we looked, we asked people in the general population to um to take a test of systemizing which is kind of understanding how systems work and we also asked them for some dna and what we what we what we found was that some of the genetic variants the, the genes that we all carry that are associated with a high score in systemizing overlap with the known genes for autism so this is how we, this is, this gives us a clue that right through our human evolution, if you go back 100,000 years, as long as humans have been inventing complex systems, mm -hmm. you know, complex tools, you know, the, the people who were inventing these things were coming up, coming up with new ways of doing things. It was probably because of their genetic makeup that drives them to look at the world in terms of these patterns and how they can do things differently. Uh, and these are the genes that are also involved in autism. So it just it kind of changes the way we think about autism. That, you know, if you, tr if you try to imagine who was, the, who was this person that invented the bow and arrow mm. 75,000 years ago, or who invented the first musical instrument, which was yeah. a, a flute that's been found that dating 40,000 years old, you know, who, who were these individuals who made the first sculptures, the first cave paintings, you know? Yeah. And, you know, it seems like there's an overlap with people who have a lot of autistic traits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That kind of, the creative mind and the curiosity as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, fascinating, fascinating. So I suppose Spectrum 10K, you mentioned it there, Simon. And uh, so what is, what is Spectrum 10K? So, uh, as the name sounds, we, mm -hmm. we, we, want to, we want to invite 10,000 autistic people across, oh. across the UK to take part in this study. Um, and they'll be asked to donate a saliva sample so that we can look at their DNA. But they'll also be asked to go on to our website to take lots of tests. And if they don't have, um, you know, if they don't have the skills to fill in tests on a computer or on the internet, their parents can do it with them or can do, mm -hmm. can do, can do these tests on their behalf. Yes. yes uh, so, it's, yes. It's, so, so really the project is, is going to be collecting a lot of information about the skills and the challenges that autistic people have. We'll, we'll then have DNA samples that we can relate their profiles back to their DNA. But, we're, okay. but, but we'll also be collecting information about their, their experience. You know, what kinds of interventions have they had? Uh, what kinds of educational programs have they been part of? 
And the whole the whole project is to try to understand how come autistic people are really so different to each other in terms of their outcomes. Because we know that some autistic people end up with poor mental health. Some some autistic people end up with, um, you know, uh, other medical conditions. We've we've talked about epilepsy, for example. Yes. yes. You know, the, the the range of outcomes is really quite broad, and what we what we're trying to do in this project is is to try to um, understand the causes of all of this variation in the autism spectrum. Okay, okay, very good. You, you kind of, you went ahead into my, I suppose, well, the next question I had about it in terms of the purpose, the purpose of, of Spectrum 10K. I suppose, is there, is there a particular hypothesis that you're, you're working off of in terms of that? Or, I mean, it's such a huge uh, research. I'm sure there's multiple, uh, m multiple areas that you're, you're exploring and, and uh, trying to measure at different, at different times. But I suppose, um, yeah, uh, is, in terms of, say, for example, will it look for a cure, for example, of autism? Uh, things like that, you know, is, is, is that something that, um, yeah. you, know, you know? Well, um, so let me answer the previous question first, which is, sure. Sorry. you know, yeah. what, what's the sort of hypothesis? And the kind mm -hmm. of, you know, the, I suppose the, the main hypothesis is that there are going to be subgroups within the yeah. spectrum. And at the moment, we just have this single word autism, which is like mm -hmm. an um, it's like an umbrella term. It's meant to cover, you know, anyone who's, who, who needs this diagnosis. And yet we know there must be subgroups out there in, you know, within the autism population. So the, ho the hope is that, you know, if we have the genetic information and kind of experience or environmental information, we'll be able to identify subgroups and that that might be kind of more meaningful than just saying, you know, you're autistic. You know, so if you think about other, if you think about other conditions in medicine, oft, often what you try to do is become more fine grained. You know, you talk about type one or type two or type three or whatever. And in, yes, in, autism, yeah, yeah. in autism, maybe we need that too. Yeah. With, a view, with a view to saying, well, if you're type one, uh, you might benefit from this kind of intervention, whereas if you're type two, maybe we should be steering you towards another one. Yeah. So, so I guess yeah. that's the kind of main purpose. But in terms of your, your other question about cure, mm -hmm. um, we're not trying to cure autism itself. You know, autism is part of the person. You know, mm -hmm. we, we don't want to kind of change who the person is. It's autism is part of their, you know, partly genetic makeup. I mean, we already know that autism is strongly genetic. You know, it runs in families. You know, so we're not really trying to cure autism itself. Uh, if they, if there are symptoms which the person is really struggling with, you know, and again, I keep re returning to this example of epilepsy, but there may be other ones too. Yeah. Then, then cure may well be the the right mm -hmm. thing to be aiming for. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I uh, look. I knew it was a it was a loaded question, and in terms of the the use of the word cure, um, absolutely, and and it, it it leads into all sorts of ethical and and moral discussions around 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 autism and and so on and so forth. And uh, maybe maybe that's for for another day, Simon. I don't. I, um, so I suppose in terms of uh, who who's involved. Who's who's involved in the research? Uh, you know um, that that kind of thing, uh, and and then and also what what is involved? What, what, you've you've described it briefly there a little bit as well. Yeah. So in terms of the team, we you know we got funded by the Wellcome Trust, which is a charity. Um, doing this kind of research is uh, is expensive. You know mm -hmm. you have to sort of pay salaries of uh, a team of people. So. Um, and the, the team includes both geneticists, psychologists, uh, you know, people who can work with, with data, so, you know, data scientists. Uh, we're working quite closely with uh, the Sanger Centre, which is in Cambridge, where the human genome was first unravelled. Wow. wow. So, okay. Yeah. You know, we're very pleased that, you know, some of the world's top scientists are finally, look, finally looking at autism to kind of further our understanding of it. Right. Um, yeah. and, in, and then in terms of, you know, what's, what's involved, 
for you know if you're if you're over 18 and you're autistic and you can go online then all you have to do is go to our website it's called spectrum10k.org and uh you know and you'll you'll be invited to uh register and um you know consent so you get a chance to kind of read the information and decide if you're happy to take part you know if you're under 18 then we're encouraging parents to do this on behalf of their okay. child. Um, okay. And, you know, what we want is we want a kind of a good representation of the whole spectrum. So we're not just after, like, autistic people who have good intelligence necessarily. You know, mm-hmm. if, if, some, if someone's autistic and has learning difficulties, mm-hmm. we, we, need to, we need to make sure they're included as well. But they may need they may need help to do that, or 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 a proxy like a parent. Of course, yes, of course, yeah, very good, very good. And uh, in terms of the 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 genetic information or any findings, will 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 the participants have any access to or feedback on on um, on their on I suppose on right? On, on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Their genetic makeup. So we actually discuss yeah. we discuss this as a team. We thought right. we thought about it long and hard. Because, because um, you know, actually it turns out to be quite difficult to give that kind of feedback. You'd have to do it on a one-to-one basis. And, wow. you know, so you'd need, you'd need to have a, a very different kind of clinical team. Uh, it might be like a genetics counsellor to be able to talk, yeah. to, to talk to each family or each individual. And I think our team won't have that kind of resource available. So what, okay. we're, gonna, so what we're really doing is just kind of looking at the genetic information uh, in terms of patterns in the data. Mm-hmm. So, Very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, just like autistic people love patterns, so do scientists. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we'll, 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 we'll be looking at the patterns to see if we can identify these subgroups and find correlations, you know, or relationships yeah. between one profile and another. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we won't be sort of feeding back to individuals what their genetic okay. makeup is. And that's... That's simply because this is just a research study. Yeah. Uh, if somebody wants to, to, to kind of um, find out about their genetics, really they should go to a genetics counsellor and, ah, right. and have that one-to-one relationship where it can be done. You know, and sometimes people do that. If for, exa- if, for example, there's a family history of, you know, a very serious disease, mm-hmm. you know, so people go to kind of genetics counsellors for if they're worried about family history of cancer, for example. But but it's not clear that that's really needed, or certainly we wouldn't have the resources to do that uh, in the case of autism. Okay. Okay. Very good. Very good. How uh, with such a huge uh, undertaking, how long will the program run, and and when do you when when do you hope to start publishing some I suppose results or hints of of uh, how your findings are going? Yeah. So I think um, so. So we've got uh, three years for this to run, okay. um, and uh, I would imagine that within the first year we'll already have the first results and we will be publishing them as you say so the usual thing is results get published in scientific journals but we will also be making them more publicly accessible so we'll be putting the results up up on our website for example um in in more accessible term more accessible forms so that it's not just hidden within a lot of jargon technical jargon but actually you know there's a kind of um versions of the results uh, which are very accessible to people Uh, and then what we're also going to be doing is joining forces with colleagues internationally so we've so we'll have our collection if you like of 10,000 DNA samples with all the Mm -hmm. psychological data that goes with it and again with the consent of the of the participants we can then donate that information to a more international collection because sometimes you can't really sort of see what's causing what unless you have really unless you have really huge population studies yeah you know yeah. so so the, the the goal really is to work with colleagues in the states in australia mm-hmm. in sweden in many countries to kind of join for, join forces 
so that we can be looking at a hundred thousand autistic people, not just ten thousand. Wow. So wow. this so this is kind of yeah, this is kind of like the UK's um effort to be part of right. some to be part of something very international. Yeah. And that's amazing. And then, of course, you've got all the cultural overlaps and, and uh, genetic, as you're, uh, you know, in terms of that as well. So uh, it, it, it definitely is. I'm, I'm uh, you know, that's exciting. That's exciting. I'm definitely uh, um, getting the, uh, the, the, geek, the geek excitement there in terms of, um, I suppose, in terms of Ireland uh, as well. Uh, I know Northern Ireland is included in the in the research study. So um, we'll see. We'll see what comes of uh, of our uh, academic colleagues over here and see if uh, see, see what happens there. Um, in terms of, um, I suppose, uh, we will obviously put all the links to the uh, to the Spectrum 10K website, and we'll share um, we'll share all the links on social media as well. Your your colleague uh, Mina has sent me through some of the information. That's how I was able to prepare today, and a special thanks to her as well. Actually, um, we'll certainly share on on um, on Twitter and on all the and all the rest, all the usual uh, social media platforms. Simon, um, I'm very mindful of your time so I just want to say uh, we're so grateful to have you on it's a uh, it's a big deal for us here anyway uh, certainly delighted to have you and thank you again so much for your contribution worldwide um, and uh, I mean if, if I can also say you know I'm very grateful to you for reaching out you know because yeah. you know this is a, a study which um, let's leave aside the whole UK thing you know, this right, this yeah. is a, this is a study that could contribute to knowledge worldwide, mm -hmm. um, and you know the fact that you've taken time to you know to to be interested in it. We're very grateful to you, and of course, and of and of course, your listeners, people who follow your podcasts, could mm -hmm. be could be located anywhere. That's the nature of social media. Yeah, very true. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Any, uh, uh, glad to do our bit for the effort, for sure. <laughs> thank, thank you very so much. Lo lovely to meet with you. And listen, if, if um, we'd love to have you on again, there's so much things. I'd love to do a deeper dive into your book, for example, and other things as well. So look, we'll keep in touch and, um, and uh, we can, uh, we'll see what, what, what's next on the horizon. Great, thank you very much. Not at all. Thank you so much, Simon, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to listen. We hope you took something of value from it. For our listeners in the UK interested in participating in Spectrum 10K, or if you wish to find out more information about the research project, please go to www.spectrum10k.org. That's S-P-E-C-T-R-U-M 10K.org. You'll find links and show notes on the website. As always, we understand everyone's journey is unique. However, it's also reassuring to know that you're not alone on your journey. If you have any ideas or suggestions or just want to reach out, please contact us. You can email hello at polarbearproject.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube and Twitter with the hashtag Polar Bear Project Podcast. The project is currently 100% voluntary. You can donate and subscribe on the website and we're so grateful for all the support we've received to date. If you'd like to advertise on the show, please get in touch with us also. That's all for now. We look forward to sharing another episode with you soon. We welcome your input. We can't say it often enough. Your lived experience matters. If you want to be heard, we're listening. Until the next time, take time. One, two, three, four. Wow. This is so exciting. Wow. It's so exciting.